you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. And when you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm done chasing
If you say release, I'm letting go If you're in it with me, I'll begin And when you say to jump, I'm diving in If you say be still, then I will wait and If you say to trust, I will obey All right, so we started a, a, a series uh, last week called, uh, I love this, uh, it's called Arise Warrior. I love it. Did you know that God has given you, if you're in Christ, God has given you a warrior spirit? The Bible says if that same spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he's not dormant, he's not apathetic, he will quicken, he will make, a, make you alive. You know that God has put a sword in your hand? You can read it in Ephesians chapter six. That sword is not the cut up chicken. Uh -uh, that sword is for you to go on the attack. It's called the word of God and it needs to not only be in your hand, it needs to come out of your mouth. God told Joshua in Joshua chapter one, verse eight, when Joshua was gonna take over for Moses, God told him, he said, look, my, my word, I want you to meditate in my word. Joshua, do you wanna be successful? I want you to meditate, not just memorize, I want you to meditate my word, I want you to mull it over and over, I do not want my word to cease from coming out of your mouth. That's why we tell you, you need to speak the word, don't just read it, don't just grab this card and just sit there on your sofa and read it, say it aloud, say it aloud. All these people that are a lot smarter than, than me, like Carolyn Leaf, who study the brain and the mind and, the, and your neural pathways and all that, will tell you it takes 21 days, 21 days for you to form a new neural net, a new neural pathway in your mind. They look like tree branches. Anybody ever see them? And, and the ones that are positive and, and, and are full of the word of God, and, and they're, they're bright. And the ones that are negative, and sour and full of bit, they're dark. They really are. You can check that. It's on Google so you know it's true. Amen. So we started a fast a week ago, last Wednesday, and said for 21 days, we would like you to read this out loud at least once a day. Some of you twice, some of you three times a day. And you renew your mind. 
Amen. Get rid of that old lethargic, apathetic, depressed spirit. Are you listening to me? And arise, warrior. I love it. I'm going to arise. I don't know about everybody else. Arise, shine, for the light has come. The glory of the Lord's upon you. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. I love it. Arise from the depression and the prostration in which, someone say, circumstances have kept you. Why do you let circumstances bind you and hold you in? We're going to talk about that today. Your circumstances are not your destiny. Your circumstances do not control your destiny. He says, uh, rise to a new life, shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord for your light has come, past tense, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. We say we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna tackle, we're gonna conquer five things, five elements that hinder people from reaching their goals or hinder them from their ministry or basically hinder them in the affairs of life. And these five goals are toxic perceptions, toxic thinking, toxic behavior, toxic excuses. Woo, that's gonna be a good one. And the last one I think we can all relate to, toxic relationships. So these we'll be covering in the next few weeks. Today we're gonna cover toxic perceptions. We're gonna start by giving you a definition. Of course, uh, uh, to, a toxic is a substance with an inherent property that tends to destroy. We probably all know that. We probably all had toxic thinking before, toxic relationships. Mostly probably toxic relationships we can think of. But that's what it does. It's an inherent property that leads to destroy something harmful or deadly. Perception is a concept or an idea that depends on recognition by the senses. And what that means is you have this idea, this perception of what should be happening, what's going to happen, what should be said, what's going to be said. And then when you get there, you find out it's completely different. And all of a sudden your, your senses go into a shock because that's not what you perceived. It is that which you perceive that you want to become reality. And we're gonna get into that here in 2 Kings uh, chapter five. I love it when Paul, by the writing, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, told young Timothy in 2 Timothy, when Timothy was struggling as a pastor and Paul told him, he said, Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear. He's given you the spirit of power. Power's the first one. And then love, and then a sound mind. Jesus said you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So there again, you have a warrior spirit in you that you need to collaborate with, you need to comply with, you need to cooperate with. We are co-laborers with God. Can you say amen? So we're going we're gonna to cover this. Where am I at here? Five toxins today. Okay. So before we get into that, we're going to talk about the difference between happiness and joy. So I, I love being happy. My, life, my wife loves it when I'm happy. But there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness comes from the word happenstance. Happenstance are those situations that happen to you or around you that you had no control over. Okay? Happenstance. And uh, some of those things are, ha are happy. We get happiness from that. Uh, sometimes they're not so happy. But happiness, the word happiness comes from happenstance. Things that happen around you or to you, you had no control over. And let, let me warn you about being happy, especially couples. Especially those of you, Ty, who are about to get married. Yeah, and Jonah. Amen. These people, they think they want to get married. Amen. This is a happy idea. Oh, happy. Sing that song and everything. And then the wedding happens. Uh huh. And then the marriage begins. And you think you know them. And all of a sudden, time goes by. And woo. You're not as happy as you were. Let me tell you a mistake a lot of people make, even Christians. When you look to somebody else to make you happy, that is a toxic perception. I want to marry this person, Pastor Mike. I think they'll make me happy. I'll go, whoa, wait, whoa. You're not a candidate for marriage. 
Now, they, there may be, they may make you happy in one way or another. You may have some happy times. How many knows that's true? But if you are looking to a person to make you happy, you are going to be truly disappointed. Nobody can make you happy but you. People say, well, Jesus makes me happy. Well, thank God for it. But he didn't come to make you happy. He came to make you holy. It's not the happy Bible. It's the holy Bible. The angels around the throne don't cry happy, happy, happy. They cry holy, holy, holy. So nobody can make you happy but you. So if you look to people or things or situations to make you happy, let me, let me give you a case in point here. Let's just get into it. Happiness versus joy. You ready? Happiness is an emotional response to an outcome. Yesterday, there were a lot of Chiefs fans happy. Why? Their team won. Any Chiefs fans in here? Okay, now who'd they play? Who? Your Colts. You were unhappy. Yes, because happiness is an emotional response to an outcome. If I win, I will be happy. If I lose, I won't. And all the Chiefs fans will be happy until next Saturday or Sunday if they lose. Then all of a sudden they're going to be unhappy. Why? Because happiness, let's read it. Happiness is an if then cause and effect quid pro quo standard that we cannot sustain. It's fleeting. Why? Because we immediately raise it every time we attain it. Chiefs fans are happy, but that's going to last for, they'll be happier if the Chiefs win next weekend. And then they'll be happier if they win the Super Bowl. So happiness, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's a it's a bad thing to make as your foundation in life. I'll be happy. I like being happy. I do. But I'm not going to, uh, we'll get to it in a minute. Happiness demands a certain outcome. Happiness is result reliant. Remember that. If this person acts the way I think they ought to act, if this happens the way I think it ought to happen, I'll be happy. If happiness is what you're after, then you're going to be let down frequently and you're going to be unhappy much of your time. Why, Pastor? Because we live in a fallen world and life's not fair. And bad things do happen to good people. Of course, y'all know there are no good people, only Jesus. That's what Jesus said. There's none good but one, that's God. So we don't want to even get in that. So, but joy, on the other hand, joy is not based on anything that I do. Joy is not based on anything that happens to me or happens around me. Hear this. It's based on what Jesus has done and my believing what Jesus has done, my embracing what Jesus has done, and my declaring what Jesus has done. Joy is based on my relationship with Jesus. That's why Paul and Silas can be preaching right, in the book of Acts, get arrested, have their backs split open with, with whips, be put in the prison, their feet in, in, in chains, and in the innermost part of the prison, and at midnight, in their darkest hour, they prayed and sang praises to God because even though what happened around them was no cause for happiness, they had joy because your joy is dependent on your relationship with Jesus, not on what happens to you. So that's why you can have joy in the midst of turmoil, joy in the midst of death, joy in the midst of loss, joy in the midst of sorrow. I mean, if anybody ever told you, hey, give your life to Jesus, everything's going to be hunky-dory and everything, they're lying to you. Give your life to Jesus, it'll save your marriage. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Give your life to Jesus, you won't lose your job. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Give your life to Jesus, your, 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 your baby will live. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. We live in a fallen world. People say, oh, Pastor Mike, safest place to be is in the will of God. No, it ain't. Tell Paul that. The Apostle Paul. Hey, Paul, safest place you can be is the will of God. Yeah, my back's bleeding, my feet's in stock, and I'm in the prison, it's midnight. 
Now, the safest place to be is in the loving arms of Jesus in his salvation. That's the safest place. But don't let some preacher lie to you and say, oh, if you're in the will of God, nothing bad's going to happen to you. No, chances are if you're in the will of God, plenty bad is going to happen to you. In fact, you obeying the call of God and the will of God for your life may cost you your life. You obeying the call of God and the will of God for your life may cost you your possessions. You obeying the call of God and the will of God in your life may cost you relationships. You, uh, you, you obeying the call of God and the will of God in your life may cost you your health. Now, who was the young man just a few weeks ago went to take the gospel to those people off of India was killed by arrows, a Rama graduate. He's not sorry. So joy's based on my relationship with Jesus. That's why I can lose everything. And yeah, I'm going to be sad because my happiness is result reliant. Right? If I lose things, I'm going to be sad. But that doesn't affect my joy. I can be crying and worshiping Jesus in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my sorrow, in the midst of my of, of death. Do you know him? That's the question. So, here we are in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. Are you with me? Amen. All right, 2 Kings 5. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of this. We're going to start with verse 1. Naaman was a captain of the host of the king of Syria. Not Israel. Syria is the enemy of Israel. And here's Naaman. Here he is, a wonderful captain. And let, let's just read about him real quick here. He, he was a great man with his master, with his king. He was an honorable man. And by him, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Imagine that. Jesus giving deliverance through this captain of Syria when Syria is an enemy of the Israelites. Incredible. He was also a mighty man in, of valor. He was a man's man, but he was a leper. He had leprosy. Leprosy is that skin disease that keeps eating and eating and eating until finally you're dead from it. You lose your fingers, you lose your nose, you lose your face, you lose your toes, your feet. It just eats away at you. It's a slow, horrible, painful death. And so here's Naaman. We don't know how he got it, but I want you to picture Naaman. And here he is with all of his armor on and that big flume on his helmet and he's standing and looking at his reflection and he is an honorable man and he is majestic and he is just impressive to look at. And he's a captain. And the Lord has used him to win great victories. But every night when he took his armor off and looked at his reflection, he was reminded of who he was. He was a leper. His armor would hide that. Are you trying to use armor to hide what you really are? You can dress yourself all up just like the Pharisees did. They look so pretty. They look so righteous. They look so holy. And Jesus pointed them out and said, you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You are like graves that, that do not appear. You are empty. You're hollow. Death abides in you. Jesus called them out. So there's Naaman. Now, if you read on down, it says that there was a maid, a slave girl in Naaman's house that one time Naaman and his people, they went on a raid in Israel and they captured some people. And this is one person they captured. They brought this unnamed maiden girl back and she waited on Naaman's wife. She also waited on Naaman as well, but mostly on his wife, helped her do the household uh, stuff and the chores and whatever. And I love this about this little unnamed girl. And in this story, God uses three unnamed servants to administer deliverance and healing to Naaman. So you are sitting out here and you think, well, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. 
Mm -mm. God will use you if your attitude is right. God will use you if you're willing to humble yourself and serve people. This girl, instead of uh, when she was taken captive as a slave, instead of her throwing a temper tantrum and throwing a fit and saying, I'm not doing nothing, you might as well kill me, I'm not gonna serve you. No, she began to serve Naaman's wife and his household to such a place she actually had genuine love for Naaman and his wife. And it bothered her to see Naaman in this condition. And she made a statement and she said, I would to God that my Lord Naaman were with the prophet that is in Israel because the prophet Elisha would recover him of his leprosy. Why would she say that? Jesus, referring to this story, said nobody in Naaman's time had ever been healed of leprosy except Naaman the Syrian. So how would she say that? Why would she say that? How would she know that? She was said that by divine, by divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so word gets back to Naaman. Naaman goes to his king and he tells his king, listen, there's a prophet. But the little slave girl at my house said there's a prophet in Israel that, 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 that I could go there and be healed. And so the king sends a letter to the king of Israel and saying, look, I'm gonna send you my captain, Naaman, and I want you to recover him of his leprosy. And the king is like, what in the world am I God that I could make alive? Uh, no, surely the king of Syria looks for a reason to, to attack me, he looks for a reason to find fault with me and he tears his clothes in, in, uh, in, in anguish. Elisha hears about it. Thank God for a man of God who knows who he is in Jesus. And Elisha hears about it. Elisha tells the king, don't get worried, don't get upset. Why are you renting your clothes? Send that man to me. And so they tell Naaman, look, you're gonna go. The prophet says he'll see you. So Naaman, he puts on his best coat of armor, his best red flume that he's got. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at those movies and I see those people, oh man, I just, I get a man crush all of a sudden. I'm like, I get a, I get, there's a bromance happening, man. I mean, like, what a man. Give me a helmet, give me a flume. Give me some armor. I'm not too sure about the little skirt, but everything else looks good. I like the sword and the dagger. Come on, brother. And so he gets his best coat of armor on and he gets his best Escalade chariot and he's got it polished all up. And the Bible says that he gets his best Arabian horses and they're white stallions and oh, I can just picture it in my mind and Naaman's gonna go see the man of God and he takes with him all this silver and all this gold and he takes all these changes of raiment clothing and he's so impressed, he's impressing himself and he's going, he's got some servants with him and they go to Elisha house and this is how I know Elisha is not a TBN preacher. <laughs> Got to get my jab in for TBN, amen. He didn't even go to the door. You ain't going to buy a true man of God. You're not going to buy him with your flattery. You're not going to buy him with your money. You're not going to buy him with your servanthood. You're not going to buy him. So here comes uh, Naaman, whoo, that Escalade chariot pulls up, beep, he honks the horn. And Elisha's sitting in there, probably on a rocking chair and tells a servant, go talk to him. And I'm gonna paraphrase here, but you can read it in your Bible. He tells, he tells Naaman, he says, look, you wanna be healed? You need to humble yourself. And you need to disrobe all your fancy garments, and you need to go dip in the muddy Jordan River, not once, not twice, but seven times. And let me tell you why. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Some of you will never advance spiritually because you're too prideful to worship Jesus. Now, you're not gonna be all wild and everything like maybe I get, but you can do what the Bible says, lift holy hands to God. You can close your eyes, focus on Jesus and sing out of your heart the praises that he's due. 
You can do that without caring what anybody thinks about you, but some of you won't because you're too prideful. And that's why you'll be in the same spot you are now next year at this time. Because you won't humble yourself. You won't bow before the mighty Jesus and tell him how bad you need him and how you're nothing without him and how without him you're good for nothing and you're just fit for the dunghill. But through him you can do all things because he strengthens you and then you arise warrior. Oh, uh, yeah. And so the servant comes out and he says, look, there's the muddy Jordan River down there. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. What's the Lord God of Israel been saying to you that you refuse to obey? Ooh, now I'm meddling, which is what good preachers do. So the servant, not even a, another unnamed servant, comes out, delivers the message of God to the man whom God loves, to the man whom God wants to heal. You better hear this. To the man whom God wants to deliver, to the man whom God wants to set free, but it's gonna be on God's terms, not yours. That's a toxic perception. When you think God will write deliverance, bring deliverance and bring healing and bring blessing by your preconceived idea, by your perception, and you refuse his. So I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. This is good preaching, Pastor. I only got two hours to finish it. All the visitors went, what? But Naaman was furious. King James said he was angry. Have you ever been angry? God says, look, I want you to start tithing. Uh, uh. No man can tell you to tithe. Tithing is giving 10% of your income to God. No man can tell you to do that. Plenty have tried. But when God tells you, it's not because God needs it. He walks on streets that are transparent gold. They're not paved with gold. They are transparent gold. He sits on a throne of, of, of emerald. He has his gates of his, and oh, God has gates, sorry. He has his gates of the city made out of pearl. So when God tells you to give, when God tells you to tithe, it's not because he's trying to take from you. Those are avenues God has established to bless you. But it's all done in faith. Some people tithe and they don't tithe in faith and nothing happens and they get all mad because they have a toxic perception. They, they, they think it's like playing the lottery. Whew, Naaman was furious and he went away. He was going to die a leper. They're Christians. You, you don't want to hear about, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You don't want to hear that. You want, I'm a Christian. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't have to. You get to. I saw this meme. I was going to put it up, but the weather hit, and I thought, no, people think I'm trying to be cruel. So I didn't. But I saved it. So I can put it up in a few weeks. I saved it for today, right, for the people that did come. And it's the thing about, here's Peter at the pearly gates, because it's always Peter at the pearly gates, right? And there's these people sitting there looking at him. He says, now look, I know you never really went to church. You just watched it on TV. Well, here's the new Jerusalem. You can't really enter in, but you can watch it on TV from over here. <laughs> and of course, none of y'all need to hear it because you're in church. But this is going out on the television, so make sure they hear that. Someone just caught television. Yes. Okay. I got to wind this up. Wesley, if you're in the house, come play for me. But Naaman was furious and he went away and he said, here it comes, toxic perception. I thought my perception was, I threw that in there, that he will surely, the man of God will come out to me and he will stand right before me so impressed. <laughs> And he will call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. 
Have you ever had a toxic perception about your parents that's caused a root of bitterness to enter into you because it didn't happen the way you thought it should happen? Have you ever had a toxic perception about your spouse that has caused a root? I love it when the Bible calls it a root of bitterness, not a fruit of bitterness. A root is something deep down. And some of y'all have that because of toxic perceptions, perceptions you've had of your parents, of your spouse, of a boss, of a friend. And Naaman, he turned that chariot around and he whipped those Arabian horses and he took off and he was going to die a leper, though God loved him. Though God had brought him to Elisha, you better hear this. He's brought you to church to deliver you. He's brought you to the body of Christ to heal you. He's brought you to bless you and to minister to you and to tell you, arise, warrior. And he flipped that thing around and he's mad. And your Bible says, one of the servants came to him probably so gingerly and said, Master, if the prophet would have bid you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Why not this small thing of wash and be clean? And thank God for the grace of God and the mercy of God. Thank God for second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and sixth chances. Thank God for his mercy because Naaman, for whatever reason, listened to that unnamed third servant. And he turned that chariot around. It's time for you to turn around. It's time for you to turn your chariot around in repentance and go back and obey the word of God. It's time for you to leave off your toxic perceptions that will rob you from the blessing of God, that will rob you from the power of God, that will rob you from, from, the, from the joy of God. It's time for you to get rid of those toxic perceptions and say, God, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts above my thoughts. If you said it, I'll believe it, even though I don't understand it, even though I may not even agree with it. I will obey it and I'll see what happens. He turned that chariot around, repented, because that's what repentance is. It's a 180. And he went and he stripped himself of his armor and he walked down in that muddy Jordan. You can hear it before he says, I got rivers better than the Jordan. We got rivers in Syria better than this old muddy Jordan. But that ain't what God said. You want what God has? You got to get it the way God says, get it. That's tweetable right there. You want what God has? You got to get it the way God says, get it, or you're not going to get it. God's some person you can't finagle, you can't buy, you can't coax. You cannot manipulate. Right now, in your spiritual life, you are exactly where you desire to be. I want to say that again. Right now, in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual growth, in your spiritual development, you are exactly where you desire to be. You want more? Desire more. You want more? Arise, warrior, and go after it. Somebody find that verse for me, please. It just came to my mind. Somebody find that verse, or maybe I can find it, but uh, be looking for it. The kingdom of God suffered violence. The violent take it by fourth. Someone call that out. Where's that at? Where's that at before I, uh, I, I, I search it and I find it? Someone got it. It's in the gospels. Jesus said it. I'm gonna tell you, oh, come on. Matthew eleven twelve, 12. Matt, this is going to bless you, I hope. Matthew 11 and verse 12 says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And if you're like me, you're like, mm, what in the world is that saying? So let me give you another translation that will help you understand that. At least it helped me. Can I do that? going to do it anyway, right? It's my church. Hallelujah. Uh, 
I know that's arrogant sounding, isn't it? But no, I'm trying to help you. Here's what it says. From the moment, Elizabeth, get ready. You're going to love this. From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of the power. Oh, come see me later. I'll tell you. Thank you. The realm from the John, since John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of its power. Are you passionate? Whoo, what are you bringing into 2019? It's not too late. We're just a couple of weeks in. What toxic perception do you need to ditch and leave in the past? I hope this has helped you this morning. Every head, I got more, but I'll, I'll bring it next week. I promise you. In Jesus' name, if I'm alive. Every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would please. I want to ask you two questions. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you here this morning? You say, Pastor, man, I used to walk with Jesus. I did. He was my Lord and my Savior, but I've drifted from him. I've drifted. I've lost my fervency. I left my first love. But Pastor, today, today I want to recommit my life to Jesus. Or you'd say, Pastor, I've, I've known about Jesus and I believe in him, but I've never opened my life to him. I've never given him my allegiance. I've never said, Jesus, I want to serve you all the days of my life. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. So if that's you, if you say, Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Christ, or Pastor, I know him, I believe in him, but I've never opened my life up and received him. But Pastor, I want to. If that's you, now listen, I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up and back down again. I want to pray with you. If that's you, Pastor, there's one. Pastor, Pastor, I, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. There's two. I need to recommit my life to Jesus or Pastor. I need to receive him for the first time in my life. Two people have raised their hand. Two people. If that's you, I want to pray with you. There's three. There's three. There's three. I want to pray with you. Put your hand up till I acknowledge you. I'm the only one should be looking. Pastor, that's me. I need to recommit. I'm going to wait 10 more seconds. You're not, there's another. You're not here by accident this morning. There's another. Thank you. You can put it down. Thank you. You're not here by accident this morning. There's another. There's two more. God bless you. Two more. There's another one. One of the youth. Thank you. Pastor, I will need to recommit. And listen, Jesus sees you raising your hand. I do not believe you would raise your hand to Jesus unless you're serious. So I believe in your sincerity. I believe in your sin seriousness. There's another one. Thank you. And in a moment, we're going to pray. Anyone else? Wait five more seconds. Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. All right, let's all stand. Let's all stand. You that raised your hands, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but listen to me. I, I can't save you. Obviously, you know that. Only Jesus can save you. So when you repeat this, repeat it to Jesus. Get your heart and your mind on him. He sees you. He loves you. He hears you. You say this to him, and I promise you on the authority of the word of God that cannot lie. When you say this and you mean it and you say amen at the end, I promise you Jesus will have heard you. He will have come into your life. He will have washed you from all of your sins. He will have taken up residence in you by the power of his Holy Spirit. And you will be either a son or a daughter of the most high God and royal blood will flow through your veins. And the next time we sing that song, it'll have a lot more meaning when you say, I am a child of God. So you pray this prayer. The rest of us, we're gonna pray it with you to support, and you may be saying, Pastor, I didn't raise my hand, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit now and I want to recommit. Fine, pray it. So let's pray this together. Y'all ready? 
Say, Jesus, thank you for who you are and your love for me. Thank you for reaching out to me, for calling me to yourself, for the promise of forgiveness, the promise of a new life. Here I am, Jesus, and I ask you, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, be my healer, be my deliverer, set me free of anything that hampers me. Forgive me of my sins. I receive your forgiveness right now. I receive your love right now. I receive your Lordship right now. And I give you my allegiance and I thank you and I praise you. And let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to have my couple come down here, Jessica and Kirby Young. Hallelujah. Kirby's an elder. Jessica's a women's leader. If you prayed that prayer, listen, they have, they want to meet you right up here. If you prayed that prayer, I encourage you, please come. They want to put a gift in your hand. They'll pray with you if necessary. So we're going to pray to be dismissed. And if that's you, when we, after we pray and say well, you're dismissed, please come if you're willing. Amen. Jesus, thank you for these people. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your reality, that we have a relationship with you. Thank you for your lordship and your kingship. We know we're not perfect. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Lord, protect these that slick outside. Let your angels encamp. Round about them in their vehicle. Protect them from all evil and harm. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Please, you that raised your hands, please come and they'll meet you right here.